Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessel Nor in Baltimore. We have a special guest today, Professor Carl Alexander. He's just released a new book, The Long Shadow, Family Background, Disadvantaged Urban Youth, and the tra Transition to Adulthood. Talk about why you carried out this study, which spanned three decades and a large portion of your career. Interestingly, it didn't start out with the idea that it would be a 30-year project. Uh, my colleagues and I uh, were all sociologists at Hopkins, and we were particularly interested in understanding, and we're sociologists and we're interested in issues of education. So we were particularly interested in understanding why uh, some, some young children uh, get off to a more successful start at the launch of their educational careers, uh, and others have a more bump, a bumpier ride at the outset, and then uh, to look as we followed these youngsters on for a, a period of time to see what the repercussions might be in, into second grade. So did the children who struggled initially recover, or did they continue to, str to struggle? Did the kids who had a successful adjustment um, continue to do better? Uh, we call the project the beginning school study because we're f interested in the initial experience of schooling which for many young people is really a very abrupt transition. I think we, in some of our writings, we call it the transition from home child to school child. And um, what children experience in the institu institutional setting of the school can be very different from what they experience at home. Now, they're being evaluated, their performance is being evaluated by a third party, a teacher. There are no strong bonds of affection or attachment to, to smooth over rough edges. And so, uh, it's, it's understood that this can be a difficult adjustment for many children. And we were interested in trying to uh, understand the repercussions of that. So the, the plan initially, well, let me just step back and say we, we started the project in 1982. And uh, it involves almost, seven, almost 800 children, Baltimore City public school children, who were starting first grade that year in the fall of 1982. In initially, 20 schools scattered throughout the city. And the, uh, the sample was as diverse as the enrollment in the city public school system would allow at the time. And uh, that was important to us because we were interested in comparing differences, across so differences of experience across social lines. So African-American children and white children, uh, how do things work for them? And uh, similarly and differently, perhaps. Um, children from higher income families. And in the Baltimore public school s s system at the time, you didn't have many very wealthy families, but you did have parents uh, who had attended college, and 30% of our better off parents completed college. And so uh, we did have the, uh, we wanted to have the opportunity to compare middle class family experience with uh, working class or low income family experience. And then we were interested also in gender differences, boys and girls. So the idea at the outset was to look carefully and closely at the first grade experience and then to track these children into second grade. That's only two years. <laughs> um, but along the way, once we got into it, we realized that most of the heavy lifting had already been done to launch the project of this sort. Uh, we had tremendous cooperation all along the way from the school superintendent's office, school city system school superintendent's office, to the principals of the schools that we selected at random for participation to 20 schools, uh, down to the classroom teachers. Every single first grade classroom teacher in these 20 schools allowed us to come into their in, into their classes to speak with these study youngsters in the fall first grade, and then again in the spring of first grade, two, year, two interviews during the school year, at the beginning of the school year and toward the end of the school year. And uh, we obtained parental permission from 97% of the youngsters who were randomly sampled from kindergarten rosters from the previous school year. So um, that, that all, getting that all in place required an awful lot of work, but it was, it was going quite nicely, we thought. And the children themselves were very cooperative in terms of being able to be responsive to our, our wanting to meet with them and talk with them. There there's, wasn't a lot of precedent at the time in the early 80s for inter interviewing uh, children in that age range, so children who were so young. But we developed our questionnaires and they seemed to work well. So at that point, we stepped back and we said, well, um, why don't we keep it going for a little while longer? You know, second grade would be interesting, but wouldn't fifth grade be more interesting still, like the end of elementary school? And then when we got closer to fifth grade, we thought, well, why not go through the middle school years and then through the high school years? And, and we just kept the thing going uh, into a decade after high school graduation. So for these youngsters who started first grade in the fall of 1982, the spring of 1994 would have been their on-time high school graduation. We did two interview cycles with them, now as young adults, uh, the first on, after, after high school. The first was four years after high school. Uh, around the time when children who had graduated on schedule and continued on to college would be expected to be finishing up college. 
And then the second after high school interview was uh, at age uh, 28, 29, roughly 10 years after high school. We called our mature, mature, adult, high, uh, mature adult survey. And in, uh, in both of those after high school surveys, we managed to relocate and re-interview 80% of the original group. So what started out to be a project that would be two years in the field uh, turned out to be 25, 26 years in the field. And uh, we found ourselves being able to pose questions about these youngsters' life experience from early childhood through the middle grades and high school and into the years after high school. And that, having the opportunity to, to do that broadened out all our, our agenda. So we were still all curious about how children weather the first grade experience. That never went away. And we've actually written quite a bit about that focused specifically on first grade. But with this coverage of, uh, of almost 25 years of their life experience, um, we decided to look more broadly at how the circumstances of their lives as young children, in terms of their conditions in their family life, uh, neighborhood conditions and the schools where they lived and attended school, and the characteristics of their elementary school years and then eventually middle school and high school, high school experiences, the characteristics of their schools, uh, how those, um, those features of their life experience growing up influenced where they wound up later in life as young adults. So the imagery of the long shadow, which is the, the main title of the book, is uh, intended to convey the idea that uh, family casts a long shadow on children's lifelong opportunities and experiences. So this is the long shadow of family influence. But family influence extends beyond just mother, father, siblings, and, and close relatives because the family uh, decides where to live, for example. And so, in point of fact, the neighborhood context of children's experience and development is really a, derives from family. And so, too, does the school experience, because in deciding where families live, they are also deciding where the children are going to attend school. And um, we, we have a perspective that we work from. It's not original with us. Uh, uh, social scientist by the name of Richard Jesser uh, coined the expression that we use. It's the overlapping spheres of influence. So um, it's well understood that children's development, academic, personal, and otherwise, is fundamentally shaped by uh, what they experience close up in terms of their everyday realm of experience. And that would be uh, experiences in the family environment, experiences in the surrounding neighborhood, and, and experiences in school. Uh, and so those are the central institutional settings that uh, help shape children's life tra trajectories. And the overlapping idea is that some many children uh, go to schools where the makeup of the enrollment is very much like who they are themselves and live in neighborhoods that are in Baltimore and it's not an, and other You mean, other so things. you mean you, they, many students live in segregated In segregated neighborhoods. Yeah. So if they're African American, their neighborhoods are predominantly yeah. African American and their school enrollments are predominantly African American. If they're low income, they will tend to live in low income communities and tend schools with mainly other low income children. So that's the overlap of these spheres of influence. They tend to align. And when they align for disadvantaged children, the implication of that is that they're triply disadvantaged. They're disadvantaged in terms of their own, the material conditions of their own family circumstances, in terms of the economic level of their neighborhood, and in terms of the economic le neighborhood uh, level of their schools. And so um, when you put all those pieces together, in combination, they have the effect of, kind of, of moving children across different life paths, I advantaging children who happen to find themselves in advantaged circumstances and disadvantaged, disadvantaging children who find themselves in disadvantaged circumstances. And so what you find when you look over the long haul, and this is what we observe in our book, is that um, as young adults, most children grown up uh, are, uh, are very much find themselves in similar circumstances in their, as young adults as they had experienced when they were uh, children. So the conditions of family life reproduce themselves across generations would be one way of thinking about it. That there are exceptions to every rule. There's movement up and movement down, but pr the predominant tendency, and as sociologists, we focus on tendencies and patterns. We're not scrutinizing each and every detailed individual experience, but we're looking for general themes and general patterns. The general pattern is that um, children's place in society as young adults tends to recapitulate or reproduce what they experienced when they were growing up. 
And, uh, and one of our goals in the study is to try to understand how that unfolds over time. So a two-year project became a 25-year project. And uh, this book of ours, The Long Shadow, is really the culminating work of that, of that project. And we're very pleased to, to, um, to be able to put it together in the way we did. And I hope people will find it interesting. And so, you know, for anyone that has b driven through, maybe taken a train through Baltimore, um, you see that many neighborhoods are disinvested, um, you know, falling apart in, yeah. in many cases. So it's no surprise that if you grow up in that area and you go to schools with peers from that area, there's, it's, no, it's no real surprise that there's a good chance you're not going to be, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be in that area, you're going to be stuck there. Yeah, well, ab sense. absolutely. No, that's no, you know, sadly, <laughs> they, you know, the, there aren't many grand revelations here that mm -hmm. people will, will, will read about or hear about and say, wow, I never would have imagined that because, yeah. uh, because it's, it's, it's out there for, uh, for you to see and for me to see. Um, but what's unusual is to, is to see it unfold at the level of detail that we were able to, to develop with this project that has shadowed these children over 25 years. And, um, and so, so, talk so, about, so talk about what, what are the main um, important points that you think that people should take away from this study? Yeah, I, there, I think there are a number of very interesting insights. Um, so we, thought, we started out to test the proposition that the way to get ahead in the modern era, the post-industrial society, is to do well in school and then realize the benefits of the, what a college degree or, uh, will confer in terms of later life opportunities in the world of work. You know, it's the ticket to getting um, uh, into middle class and professional employment and then higher, higher earnings as a result of that. Uh, so that success narrative is very widely held, in, including held by our study participants. So we wanted to see um, how that presented itself in the life experience of, the, of this group. And what we find is a very striking pattern of, uh, of middle class family privilege, so to speak. So that the children of middle class parentage and living in middle class neighborhoods and attending schools with other children like themselves uh, are much, much more successful in school. Uh, and it's a dramatic rate you're talking about. Oh, very about. Diff vastly different experiences across mm -hmm. social lines. And um, to go to kind of the, the end of the story in a sense, uh, if you look at patterns of college completion, uh, what we find is that at age 28, which is roughly the age of our last interview with these youngsters, at age 28, 45% uh, of the children that we classify as being from more advantaged family conditions in, in early, the early elementary years uh, have attained a bachelor, bachelor's degree or beyond. Some have master's degrees, and even a few, a handful have PhD degrees at age 28. That's 45%. Children who grew up in disadvantaged family circumstances, their parents didn't finish high school. Um, they had high levels of unemployment from year to year. They're both parents, fathers and mothers. 98% uh, of them were classified as low income to, in, in, in terms of school records for qualified for reduced and free meals at school. So these are really quite disadvantaged children. Uh, at age 28, 4% had bachelor's degrees. That's a tenfold difference in baccalaureate degree completion. And, uh, and so the vast majority of these disadvantaged children, grown up, are not going to have the advantages that, that come with, uh, with a college degree to help open doors for them. Now, the, there's a very extensive here in the Baltimore area, two-year and community college system, and those, are, those schools are designed to be accessible to, to poor kids and the kids who uh, will be commuting students who can't afford to live on campus, kids who will be attending part-time because they need to work to cover tuition and to help their families. Uh, a lot of our kids start in two-year programs, but don't finish, and this is, this is sadly the case here in Baltimore, uh, but it's also reflected in national statistics. Uh, they, these, these young people face so many practical challenges in their lives outside school that it's very hard for them to stay the course. And it's not for disinterest, and it's not for one of trying. Uh, they start and uh, might uh, cobble together the tuition to cover a semester or so, and then they have to step out uh, in order to um, to raise the resources to continue or because there's a challenge, you know, their daughter is, is ill and needs their attention or they've got a... a and you're talking about specific, the, the stories that you've, you're, oh, you've yeah, heard. Oh yeah, we've heard, we've yeah. heard these stories, I, absolutely. Uh -huh. These are real, they're real people behind mm -hmm. the, the things that I say. Mm -hmm. So, um, but here's, a, here's a, so uh, we have a 40% high school dropout rate in this group mm -hmm. overall. 
which seems extraordinarily high, and it is, but it's not uncommon. It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's not high for. That's Baltimore. That's Baltimore. It's, it's many actually, urban. It's many a, urban. Yeah, uh, it's actually r right districts. about on the button with statistics yeah. citywide. So yeah. the the by in, by design, this project was supposed to provide a window on conditions throughout the city, and it does mm -hmm. a very good job of that. We have any number of points of comparison in, in the in the book that uh, you, uh, the characteristics of our schools, of our neighborhoods, and. Particulars of our children against citywide statistics, and they align very well.